Welcome to Orbital Dynamics. In this part, I'm going to teach the timing of objects that orbit along an ellipse. In the last part, I taught you the shape of an orbit. It's elliptical. I also showed you how to do an animation of an object moving along an ellipse. The shape was right, but the timing was wrong. In fact, it was the exact opposite of what it should be. In this part, I'm going to I'll teach you Kepler's second law and a bit of calculus that enables me to derive the proper time. In the last part, I talked about how Johannes Kepler discovered his first law, that the planets orbited along an elliptical path. His second law characterized the timing of this elliptical path. When he found that Mars orbited along an ellipse, he also discovered that it moved faster when it was nearest the sun and slower when it was farther away. Astronomers since Hipparchus knew that the timing of the seasons on the Earth were different. Winter in the north is shorter than summer in the north. Astronomers who preceded Kepler knew the timing of Earth's orbit was variable. Earth also orbits faster when it's closer to the sun and slower when it's farther away. Kepler found this to be the case with Mars. The second law that Kepler developed states that the area swept out by an orbiting body covers equal areas in equal time. This animation demonstrates that. Notice that at perihelion, the Earth moves faster, while at aphelion, it moves slower. The areas of all the brown wedges are the same. The motion of the Earth through each wedge takes place in the same amount of time. The orbit has to slow down in aphelion because the wedges are longer. Likewise, it has to speed up at perihelion because the wedges are shorter. In the previous part, I showed you how to plot an ellipse. In the animation that I showed you, I stepped through the area angles theta in equal increments. The steps were equal angles in equal times. I told you in the last part that the timing was completely wrong. Look closely. The orbiting body travels slower at the periapsis point and faster at the apoapsis point. Kepler, in his second law, discovered that it was the opposite. Stepping through the orbit with equal angles in equal time is the wrong method. I want to use a technique from elementary calculus to derive an equation for the timing of a body orbiting along an ellipse. This video illustrates how I've set this up. All the areas denoted by delta A are the same. The angles denoted by delta theta 1, 2, and 3, etc., are different. The time to sweep, out, to sweep out each area, denoted by delta t, is constant for each of the wedges. According to Kepler's second law, an orbiting planet moves through equal area in equal time. That's expressed by this equation. Delta A over delta t is constant. Given the way I've set this up, the areas are also equal, so delta A is also a constant. This implies that the time increment expresses delta t as constant as well. If delta A is constant, then delta T must be constant. If the areas of each wedge are equal, then the angles denoted by delta theta 1 through 4, or delta A to N, must be different. The delta thetas are not constant. They would be for circular motion. They're not for elliptical motion. The planet sweeps through each of these different angles in the same time, and in that time, they sweep out the same area. If we could have set this up differently, um, by using a constant angle, which means delta theta would be constant for each wedge. According to Kepler's second law, A over delta T must be constant. If delta theta is constant, then delta A must vary, which means delta T would also have to vary. Delta A and delta T would then have to vary in proportion to each other for delta A over delta T to remain constant. Holding the angle constant means that the time delta t must vary inversely with the change in area. This method works, but the timing is intricate. If we hold delta t constant, it makes the timing easier. When I set this up as a simulation, which I'll show you how to do later, I'd rather use a constant time step. Intuitively, I'll derive a formula Intuitively, I derive a formula for the area of elliptical wedges. 
Kepler figured out a way to do this, but it's very intricate. The Kepler method is, in fact, the conventional way to determine the timing of an orbit along an elliptical path. I'm going to simplify this with a trick from elementary calculus. Instead of elliptical wedges, I'm going to estimate the areas with circular wedges. While this isn't exact, with calculus, there's a way for it to converge on the exact result. Here, I'll derive a formula for computing the area of a wedge of a circle. A circular wedge is defined by an angle we'll call delta theta. One 360 degree revolution is two pi in two, one 360 degree revolution in radians is two pi radians. The area of the wedge is a percentage of the total area of the circle. That percentage is delta theta over two pi. The total area of the circle is pi r squared. The area of the wedge delta A is thus equal to delta theta over two pi. The fraction of the circle that constitutes the wedge times the total area of the circle pi r squared. There's a pi in both the numerator and denominator, so I can express that as one half r squared times delta theta. We want to solve for the angle theta, so let's divide both sides of the previous equation by r squared and multiply by two. That gives us the change in angle as being two over r squared times the change in area, delta A. For an ellipse, everything on the right half of the equation except one over r squared is constant. This expression says that the change in angle is proportional to one over r squared. The constant proportionality would be two times delta A. This is a very fundamental and important relationship that I'll refer back to later in a later part. It essentially implies that the timing of the orbit is inversely, inversely proportional to one over r squared. Here's how I'm going to construct circular wedges that approximate elliptical wedges. Remember that all these areas are the same and the delta t's are the same. The delta thetas vary. Notice that these circular wedges are not very good approximations. I'll resolve that here. Here's the formula I derive for the area of a wedge of a circle. I'm going to divide the ellipse into a series of wedges and use circular wedges as an approximation. This says that delta A is approximately equal to 1 half r squared times delta theta. This equation takes r as an input and approximates the area delta A. Here's the equation r for r for an ellipse. I derived this in an earlier part. We'll use this equation for the radius of each circular wedge. R will vary as the object moves along the ellipse. Here's the formula for the area of a circular wedge expressed as a limit. The way you read this is the limit as delta theta approaches zero of one half r squared times delta theta. According to calculus, that equals one half r squared d theta. d theta is a notation from calculus. It represents an infinitesimally small area. Here's how you'd express that equation in calculus notation. dA equals 1 half r squared d theta, where dA is an infinitesimally small area. The first equation that I showed you in the beginning for delta theta is an approximation. With calculus, as delta theta approaches zero, the formula for dA approaches the exact value for the area of each elliptical wedge. If I make delta theta small enough, we get the correct result. The first equation is an approximation. The second equation is an equality. That's how calcul calculus works. Here's the equation for delta theta. Delta theta is approximately two times delta A over R squared. Expressed in calculus notation, that's d theta equals two over R squared dA. The first equation was an approximation. This one is an equality. I'm not gonna go further with calculus in this part. My purpose here is to sum it is to demonstrate how differential calculus fundamentally works. From here, I'm going to use the equation for delta theta, the approximation. You might wonder why we don't just take the integral of the formula for an ellipse and polar coordinates. Integrals give us areas. The formulas for ellipses are not integrable. Circles are, ellipses are not. Kepler's discoveries were groundbreaking. However, prior to that, everybody thought that the path of orbits was circular. Prior to Kepler, the math was much simpler, albeit wrong. For bodies moving along ellipses, we have to resort to approximations. You might have noticed that the way we divided up the ellipse and circular wedges isn't very efficient. The graphic on the right is a much better approximation. On the right, some of the circular wedge is outside the ellipse, while some is inside. With calculus, however, this doesn't matter. When we take the limit as delta theta approaches zero, either method converges on the same result. The calculations for theta 
for the graphic on the left are much simpler. The calculations for the wedges on the right are a bit more complex. I'm going to go with a simpler method. Another way to estimate the area of wedges is with triangles. I want to show you how that would work. I get the same result. I have a reason for doing this, which I'll show you on the next slide. The area of a triangle is one half base times height. Over on the diagram, let's say the base is R1, and let's say the hypotenuse of the triangle is R2. That corresponds to the side A on the triangle on the left. The sine function is defined to be the opposite over hypotenuse for a right triangle. That means sine of theta is h over a. If I solve for h, I get that h equals a sine theta. If I substitute a sine theta for h, I get that the area is one half a b sine theta. The area delta a of a triangle is thus equal to one half r1 times r2 times the sine of delta theta. Let's take the limit as delta theta approaches zero of one half r1 r2 times sine delta theta. When theta gets really small, the lengths r1 and r2 get really close to each other. If I take the limit as delta theta approaches zero, the two values r1 and r2 become the same. This may seem counterintuitive, but this is the way calculus works. The limit thus equals one half r squared sine d theta. If you plot the sine function compared to x at small angles, sine x equals x. This is called the small angle approximation. As x approaches zero, sine x equals x. Hence, as delta theta approaches zero, the limit function equals one half r squared d theta. That's the same result we got with circular wedges. dA equals one half r squared d theta. Here's why I did this. I want to show you how cross products work. Let's say I have two vectors A and B. A vector is a geometric object usually depicted by a line with an arrow at one end that has magnitude and direction. Velocity is an example of a vector. If you're driving at 50 miles, 55 miles per hour, your speed is 55 miles per hour. If you're driving 55 miles per hour to the north, your velocity would be 55 miles per hour north. Velocity has a magnitude, 55 miles per hour, and a direction, north. The notation for a vector is an A or a B with a little arrow over it. Vector lengths are depicted this way. The length is a scalar. That's just a number with no direction. The length of a vector is a scalar. The normal to the vectors A and B is another vector that is perpendicular to both vectors A and B. The unit normal vector is a normal vector with length one and is depicted as a little n with a hat on it. We use unit vectors to indicate direction. Normal vectors follow the right hand rule convention. If you orient your right hand as shown in this diagram, the a vector would be your index finger, the b vector would be your middle finger, and the normal vector would point up along your thumb. The purple normal vector I'm showing you here conforms to the right hand rule. If I were to use the left-hand rule, the normal vector would point downward. The cross products of vector A and B is defined to be the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them, theta. The direction of the cross product, since it too is a vector, is along the normal vector. So the final term in this equation is N with a hat on it. These dotted lines form a parallelogram with vectors A and B. On the previous slide, I derived the formula for the area of a triangle, 1 half a times b times the sine of theta. The area of this parallelogram is twice that, which is a times b times the sine of theta. Hence, the magnitude of the cross product is the area of the parallelogram formed by the two vectors. We can thus express the cross product this way. It's a times b times the sine of theta along the normal vector. I'll show you some examples. The sine of pi over 2 is the sine of 90 degrees. That equals 1. The cross product of two vectors that are perpendicular or at 90 degrees to each other is simply a times b. The sine of 0 is the same as the sine of 2 pi, which is 1 revolution, which is the same as the sine of 360 degrees, and that equals 0. If two vectors are parallel, the cross product is 0. If you think of this in terms of parallelograms, if the angle theta is 90 degrees or pi over, over 2, then the shape is a rectangle and the area is simply a times b. 
Imagine this parallelogram is squished down to a line. Theta would then equal zero. If theta is zero, then the area of the parallelogram is zero. If theta is some other angle, the area is a times b times the sine of theta. This animation shows how the magnitude of the cross product varies with the angle theta. If I go back to this slide, I can express the equation for triangular wedges this way. It's 1 half r cross r1 cross r2. The video shows you what a normal vector looks like. This plot is three-dimensional. If I were to show you more r1 and r2 vectors where the area between them was the same, the red normal vector would be constant magnitude and direction. Later on in another part, I'll talk to you about angular momentum. I'll say now that we measure angular momentum with the cross product. When you express Kepler's law, second law this way, it means that even though the speed of the orbiting body changes along the ellipse, the angular momentum is always constant. That's consistent with the orbiting body moving faster at periapsis and slower at apoapsis. This is the conservation of angular momentum. Kepler didn't know about this. It was discovered and developed after him. For the next derivation I'm going to show you, I need some conversion formulas. So here's a quick review of a few things that I showed you before. Eccentricity of an ellipse is defined as the length from the center to one of the focus points divided by the length of the semi-major axis. It's a measure of the shape of the ellipse. We use the letter E for eccentricity and C for the length of the focus and A for the semi-major axis. If eccentricity is C over A, then C, the length to a focus point, is eccentricity times A. The convention in orbital dynamics is to define ellipses with semi-major axis A and eccentricity E. We use this equation to convert C to E times A. Recall the way I drew an ellipse in a previous part. I tied a string to both focus points and circumscribed a line. From the top of the ellipse, the length to each focus equals the length of the semi-major axis. This sets up a right triangle. In this right triangle, a squared equals b squared plus c squared. In other words, the length of the semi-major axis squared equals the sum of the squares of the semi-minor axis and the length from the center to a focal point. If we want to solve for b, then we start with b squared equals a squared minus c squared. We prefer to use e, the eccentricity, and a, the semi-major axis to characterize an ellipse. So we'll substitute ea for c. We can factor out a squared to simplify this. Taking the square root, we now have b equals the square root of a squared times 1 minus epsilon squared. We can factor out the a squared from under the radical. That leaves a times the square root of 1 minus e squared. The axis expression we use to convert b, the semi-minor axis, to a formula using semi-major axis and eccentricity. The area of an ellipse is a b pi. I'll substitute a times the square root of 1 minus e squared for b. If I combine terms, I get that the area of an ellipse is a squared pi times the square root of 1 minus e squared. As I said before, Kepler's second law states that equal areas are swept out in equal time. Mathematically, that's expressed as delta a over delta t is a constant. In this construction, I'm going to hold delta A constant, which means delta T will be constant. Holding delta A constant makes it much simpler to compute that quantity. And as I said, holding delta T constant makes the animation I'm going to do in Python much easier. If I hold delta A and delta T constant, then delta theta has to vary. In the diagram on the right, there's a delta theta 1, delta theta 2, and so on. So I'm reviewing things I'm already, I've already showed you. Here's the equation I derive for delta theta. Delta theta is 2 times the delta area over r squared. This is the equation for r that I derived earlier. This is the equation for an ellipse and polar coordinates with the right focus centered at the origin of the coordinate system. Let's pick an orbital period of 365.2425 days. That's one year. And let's pick a delta t of one day. That's the period capital T divided by 365.2425. 
if delta A over delta T is constant, then capital A over the total area of the ellipse, capital T, I'm sorry, if delta A over delta T is constant, then capital A, the total area of the ellipse, over capital T, the period of the orbit, is the same constant. This makes it trivial to determine the constant delta A over delta T. Here's the formula for the area of an ellipse that I derived earlier. Delta A over delta T is then A, capital A, the total area over 365.2425, over the total period. And that equals A squared pi times the square root of 1 minus E squared over 365.2425. The semi-major axis for the Earth's orbit around the Sun is 149,598,023 kilometers. The eccentricity is 0 0.0167086. If I plug in those values, I get this formula. And if I do all the computation, computations, I get 1.92668 times 10 to the 14th power square kilometers. This is an approximation of the area swept out by the Earth in one day in its orbit. Delta area is constant. I'll use that in this equation to derive the change in angle for each wedge. That would look like this. And if I multiply by two, I get this. We can also use values to simplify the equation for R. Here I'm plugging in values for A and E. The numerator is 1.49556 times 10 to the eighth power, and I'll leave the denominator alone. Let's compute a few delta theta angles. Here's the equation for delta theta, and here's the equation for r of theta. Orbits usually start at the periapsis point. Orbits actually don't start there. It's more accurate to say that's where theta equals zero. Here's how we derive the value for r when theta equals zero. The cosine of zero is one. That results in this, which results in this, and this is the distance from the Earth to the sun at periapsis. With a value for r, I can now compute delta theta. Here I'm plugging in 1.47098 times 10 to the eighth for r. That equals 1.77899 times 10 to the minus two radians. Perihelion is in January. The Earth advances about 0.018 radians in one day in January. r of theta one would be computed with this formula where I'm now using the cosine of theta one. That equals 1.47099 times 10 to the eighth. And notice that r is now slightly longer. Delta theta is two. Delta theta two is computed with a new value of r for theta one. It's slightly less than delta theta one. And remember that the orbit slows down after the periapsis point, so the angles get smaller. X and y coordinates are plotted with these equations for a given theta and an associated r. If you run these computations for the entire 2 pi radian orbit, you'll be able to plot daily positions for the entire Earth orbit. As I said, these are approximations. If you want more, precisions, more precision, you'd compute delta thetas every hour or even every minute. Every second would be pretty good precision. There are 525,949 minutes per year and 31.5 million seconds per year. That's quite a few computations. Here's what four points at periapsis look like for an ellipse with 0 0.8 eccentricity. If I zoom in, you can discriminate the points. Here's what more points look like. Notice the spread at periapsis and how tight they are at apoapsis. Here's what points and wedges look like to scale. The first four points at the apoapsis form long, thin wedges. The areas at periapsis are short and squat. All the areas are equal. And here's what all the points look like. These are 360 points on an ellipse with 0.8 eccentricity. Now I'm going to show you how to do this in Python.
here's the animation I showed you in the last part with the wrong timing. The circular motion is right because the motion is uniform, but it's wrong for the ellipse. This is the code I wrote in the past part that draws an ellipse, animates an object traveling along the ellipse, but has the wrong timing. Remember that this code draws two ellipses. The first thing I want to do is make the code more readable and maintainable by creating some variables for each ellipse for its semi-major axis and eccentricity. I'll need to use those in several places and I'd rather define them once. So ellipse one has a semi-major axis of five and an eccentricity of 0 0.8. And so I just created variables for semi-major axis and eccentricity. And here are all the places where I'll use those variables. Ellipse 2 is an ellipse with radius of 6 and an eccentricity of 0, which makes it a circle. So I'll create variables for those. And here's where I'll use those variables. And I like to check things, that things still work, so I'll run this. And this is still the wrong timing, but it works. So now here's how the variables work. I can now change the eccentricity of the second ellipse to 0 0.5, and I only have to do it in one place. I want to change this code to use polar coordinates as input variables rather than semi-major axis and eccentricity everywhere. I have a function for the variable r, and now I want r to be an input for x, y, and the coordinates x and y. I'll change the a and e arguments to r, and then we'll use that variable in each of the functions. So here I change A and E to R, and here I use R in the function. And I'm doing the same here. In the plot ellipse function, I'll create an array of R values. The inputs to the x and y functions are r and theta rather than a and e. And r array is an input to the uh, plot function. In the animate function, I'll create an r coordinate with the r function. And then I'll change the calls to x and y, the x and y function, so that the r-coordinate variable is an input. And I'll do that for both ellipses. 
And I'll run this again to verify that it works. Again, this is still the wrong timing, but I verify that it works. So this code now is a three-step process. For each position, I create an R coordinate, and then with that, I create an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. Theta is the primary input. Now I need to be able to adjust the timing of the animated object or um, orbiting along the ellipse. This code increments the true anomaly argument by one degree for each step of the animation. I'm now going to fix that. The code for the animation loop uses a fixed 360 frame step. Since I'm going to change the timing of the orbiting object, I need to be able to adjust the frame step rate. This enables me to speed up the animation. I do this by changing the angle that the animation advances with each animation step. I don't really need this for this part. It'll become useful when I use Kepler's formula to compute the angles. So if you didn't follow that, just watch what I do to the code. So the first thing I want to do is create a frames variable. I'll then use this to specify the frames in the animation or the animate function. And again, I'm going to run this just to make sure that it still works. Now I'm going to change the animation argument to frame step. And now true anomaly becomes a variable within the function. This lets me adjust the true anomaly. And here I'm setting it to the frame step times 360 over the frames variable. And I want to run this again to verify that it works. Now, you can see I've got the ability to adjust the timing. If I divide frames by two, I speed up the animation. If I multiply by two, I slow down the animation. And now I have control over the timing. So I'll change that back to divide by two. Here's how I do the proper timing. I want to move this block of code so it's continue, contiguous with the call to the animation function. So now this program starts with all the functions and the mainline code is at the bottom. And that's just a better way to organize the code. And then I'm going to create a variable called areas. This will determine the number of circular wedges that I'll compute for each ellipse. And here I'm setting it to 3,600. That's a big number. The bigger number means the more precise uh, the motion, the timing. And I'm going to use the frames variable differently here. Here I'm setting it to 6. And here I'm going to create a new function that computes the ellipse area. The arguments are A for the semi-major axis and E for the eccentricity. And the formula for the area is a squared times pi times the square root of 1 minus e squared. And this is how you compute that in Python. A double or asterisk is the power operator. np.sqrt is the square root function in numpy. I'll also create a function for delta theta. It takes delta area and r as inputs. And the formula is 2 times the delta area divided by r squared. 
I also want to move this block of code so it's contiguous with the lower part. And I'll create a variable for the delta area for ellipse 1. And we'll set it using the ellipse area function divided by the number of areas. And I'll do the same thing for ellipse, too. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to set ellipse 1 theta to 0. That's the starting point. And now I'll do the same thing for ellipse, too. And I'm going to reorganize the code again so it's in a more intuitive order. Now, in the animate function, I need to increase the theta variable And the theta variables are declared outside the animate function. This global statement allows me to create a variable inside the function that will persist outside. And that's kind of a cheat in software engineering. When I show you Kepler's method, I won't use this. But for now, it's kind of a brute force way to make this work. And in each of the cases, I set true anomaly to ellipse 1 theta and ellipse 2 theta. So after I derive x and y points, I need to advance the theta variables. I set the areas variable to 3,600. I don't need to plot each of the 3,600 points. I'm going to use a loop to advance the true anomaly for the number of areas divided by the number of frames. I get the precision I want without bogging down the animation. So 3,600 areas divided by 6 frames is 600. So this loop will iterate 600 times for each frame. Within each loop, I add delta theta to the theta variable. And the backslash at the end of the line lets me continue the line of Python on a subsequent line. And I need to update the R coordinate as well within the loop. I'll use the new theta variable to compute the new R. And this is essentially what I did a few slides ago when I showed you how to compute theta 1, theta 2, and associated R. And here's where I compute R. And I want to copy this and paste it in for the second ellipse. 
Now I'm ready to run this. Now notice the timing has changed and the timing between the ellipse and the circle are different. And notice too that the points converge at periapsis and apoapsis and the periods are the same. Now, if I change frames to three, it speeds up the entire animation. And here it's just plotting less points and moving through greater angles. If I change frames to nine, it slows down. If I change areas to 36,000, I get a lot more precision. But notice now that the motion in the animation is a bit jerky. That's because the for loops are iterating 6,000 times each. That's probably overkill for what we're doing here, so I'll change it back to 3600. Now I'm going to make the circle an ellipse with semi-major axis of 5. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I'll change the circle to an ellipse with semi-major axis of 5 and an eccentricity of 0 0.6. And again, you can see the timings are different but the points converge at uh, periapsis and apoapsis and the periods are the same. In fact, the half periods are the same. But the timing in between is different. Here's a comparison of the proper and the improper timing. So the red one, oh my goodness, um, my labels are backwards. So the red one is correct and the purple one is incorrect. Back to the proper timing. So again, look at this animation closely and notice that the two orbiting objects converge at periapsis and apoapsis, and the two orbits have the same period. So the radius of the circle is the same as the semi-major axis of the ellipse. The timing of the orbits is different between periapsis and apoapsis, but gets back in sync at each of those two points. Here's the proper timing with two different size ellipses. Now, this turns out to be wrong as well. There's one more correction I need to show you, and I'll do that in the next part. It gets solved with Kepler's third law, which deals with the variability in the orbit in the periods of orbits with differing semi-major axes. The outer orbit should have a longer period than the inner orbit. So in the outer orbit, the object travels a longer path at a shorter speed. The main things I want you to take away from this part is the proper timing of an orbit along an ellipse. The eccentricity doesn't affect the orbital period if the semi-major axis stays constant. It does, the eccentricity does affect the timing between periapsis and apoapsis, but not the overall period. The method I showed you was more an introduction to calculus and limits. Like I said earlier, the method of computing delta areas or delta thetas this method isn't used in orbital dynamics. Um, what is used in orbital dynamics is Kepler's formula, which I'll show you later. And I also want you to remember the cross product, which is a measure of angular momentum, which is synonymous with Kepler's second law.